We're glad to have you all here. I'm Bill Graves, the President and CEO of the American Trucking Associations, and we're very pleased to have the opportunity to host uh, this event. We think the, uh, the concept of, of emphasizing infrastructure this week is critically important. Uh, transportation in this country and the movement of freight is essential to our quality of life. Clearly, it's an issue on the front burner with, uh, with Congress at this point, with the announcement late last night uh, of, the, uh, of EPW's work. Uh, we're obviously uh, watching the, the uh, uh, proposals coming out of the White House as well, and we know over time we're going to hear from the, uh, the folks on the House side. But today we have an opportunity to, to kick this off with, uh, with my friend, Senator Roy Blunt, uh, who uh, ranking member on the Commerce uh, Transportation Subcommittee. And Roy, wherever you're hiding, come around here. And clearly there's a lot going on with the announcement last night from EPW, and obviously there'll be an element uh, of the Commerce Committee's work uh, in, in uh, the final uh, version of whatever gets developed over on the Senate side. And so, Roy, we appreciate you coming by and uh, giving you an opportunity to just address our group. Thank you for being here, and thanks for your service. Thank you. Well, thank you all. It's good to be here. Good to be here. Um, as uh, Bill said, uh, Senator Blumenthal is coming later. He and I have the, the Surface Transportation Committee in Commerce, and Senator Carper and Senator Barrasso have, have the other committee that deals with these issues. We had a freight roundtable uh, just a few days ago talking to people from all over the industry. We had a couple of people from uh, the uh, uh, the uh, transportation uh, department of transportation director from Oregon, the department of transportation director from Iowa joined us uh, from uh, that perspective, uh, and uh, you know from uh, the infrastructure is something that everybody knows we need to do a better job maintaining, and almost nobody wants to pay for it. So if we can ever figure out how to put those two things together, where you figure out a way to pay for it and do it, uh, that that'll be an important moment when we get there. I would say on that front that. Um, uh, John Delaney in the House uh, and uh, Michael Bennett and I in the Senate uh, have a bill that's gotten quite a bit of attention that uses stranded overseas profits as a way to fund an uh, infrastructure fund uh, that would be available to a broad base of infrastructure as long as there is a state or local government sponsor. And I think about 35% of the projects we would uh, encourage them to fund would have to have a, a private sector partner as well up to the law currently says 10%, but that number, like everything else in trying to put something like this, is a number you could work with. Uh, but you have $50 billion brought back from overseas, a really a small fraction of the almost $2 trillion uh, that's over there that's not coming back, that's being used to buy uh, companies in other countries. And, and who's to say that's not the best thing to do, even if that's your number two priority, you do it with 100% of your money as opposed to the 65% of your money that you might be able to bring back here and invest in what we would want to see as your number one priority. But getting those stranded profits back uh, would be critical. $50 billion in, uh, in, 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 a, in uh, setting up this fund as a way to bring a certain amount of those profits back would fund about $750 billion in infrastructure broadly defined, water and sewer projects, port projects, a bridge, what, what infrastructure in a broadly defined sense. And then Senator Warner and I have a more traditional bill, the Bridge Act, uh, that would start with $6 billion of federal money and do about $300 billion of infrastructure. But all those, I think the, the everybody I've mentioned as co-sponsors are interested in that legislation, would just see all of those as just one tool, one other tool in a toolbox that needs to be pretty filled with tools so that people uh, can find something in there that works for what they're trying to do. Doesn't replace the bigger need of the highway fund, state and federal, doesn't replace any of those sorts of things, but continues to add to our capacity to do what we need to do. Now, I, I think as a country, you know, my view is we're only about less than a handful of common sense decisions away from huge opportunities. A lot of that starts with more American energy, uh, that could quickly translate into more manufacturing jobs, all of that very dependent on infrastructure uh, and a lot of you know, world food needs doubling between now and 2070. Uh, that's easy to say. It's really hard to contemplate. 
and I think we will be able to do it, but it's not an easy thing to do, to do in the next 55 years what the, the world did in the previous 10,000 years. It took about that long to get from infant agriculture to where we are today, and in 55 years we need to produce double what we're producing today uh, all over the world. And our country, of course, is going to do a significant amount of that with this huge contiguous piece of agricultural uh, land in the Mississippi Valley. I'm, I'm, I've read somewhere it's the biggest contiguous piece of agricultural property in the world. But more importantly, we know how to do what we do, but, but it doesn't work if you don't know how to do something with it once you grow it. Uh, I was in Brazil in August with the Secretary of Agriculture. It was uh, one of several trips I've taken down there in the last 10 years where they have dramatically increased their agricultural production, but they've dramatically outsp out, outpaced their infrastructure in their agricultural production. So, you know, the ability to grow something is one thing. If you can't get it where you want to get it in an effective way, it's only um, a frustrating part of the puzzle of what you could do. And we want to be sure that we're thinking right now about the things that we could be doing a decade from now and two decades from now. Uh, I think there will be a significant discussion that hopefully will produce uh, uh, legislation in you know, in the Senate today, I'm hesitant to even use those words, produce legislation that could become law. But there's a chance that could happen. And certainly one of the priorities of our subcommittee, and I believe of Senator Rockefeller's full committee, uh, is to look at freight in the ways we did at our roundtable the other day, the ways uh, you're doing that today. Uh, how do you link all this up as obviously this panel that's going to be following uh, here in a few minutes is, is very good at. How do you link all that up so that all of these things make sense and you're moving things in the most effective way, in the most effective part of that grand process of commerce? What's it, what's it, what is it, are the conditions where you ought to put something on the water? What are the conditions where you ought to put something on the rail? What are the conditions where you ought to have something on trucks, maybe on either end of, of whatever those things are? Uh, and uh, in some cases, all the time. But, you know, what, what are the economics of that? And do you have the infrastructure that make the economics of that work most effectively? Um, in terms of just moving large quantities of things around. You know, Europe wants to have 20% biomass in their, all of their energy by the year 2020. And a lot of that biomass is going to come from us if we can get it there in a competitive and cost-effective way. Um, you know, the food needs, energy needs of all kinds. We have great opportunities, but again, we only have those opportunities if we can connect that product uh, to the market, both domestic and international, where it needs to be. Uh, and one of the competitive keys there is going to be how do we get it there? And so that's freight policy. That's what you're talking about. Hopefully, it's what we're listening to because everybody in this room knows more than the Congress certainly knows collectively and probably more than anybody knows individually about what we need to do to link all of this up to create the kind of opportunities that America will have uh, and that our families will have and individuals will have if we do this the right way. It's awfully easy to see how we miss these. It's easy to see these opportunities out there. It's easy to see how we miss them. Uh, and the very topic you're talking about today is, the criti is, is, is a critical component in whether this works or doesn't work. Uh, and so thanks for your leadership, Bill. Thanks for the panels you've put together today and uh, look forward to listening to you, not only as you talk about this today, but as you begin to reach conclusions of effective ways to really uh, meet the challenges. Again, everybody knows they're there. It's just nobody quite wants to be uh, the person responsible for, at the end of the day, making them happen, and we need to figure out how to do that. So thanks for letting me come over for a few minutes today. Uh, sure, if there are a couple of questions. Anybody need any personal advice? I'd be glad to <laughs> glad to give you that as well if you want to ask. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you very much. What we're here today is to discuss how uh, all the modes of freight movement are going to contribute to uh, sustaining the, the wonderful quality of life we enjoy. We're going to dive right in. We've got three uh, 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 excellent uh, uh, panelists uh, specific to, uh, to the trucking industry that are going to talk first about uh, about sort of our side of the equation, and then again, we're going to do intermodal uh, uh, component to that here just a little bit later. But uh, we have Bill Logue, uh, the president and CEO of FedEx Freight, 
We have Phil Bird, who uh, serves as, uh, as my chairman, head of the American Trucking Associations, and is president of Bulldog Highway Express in Charleston, South Carolina. Pat Thomas, uh, one of the vice chairmen of the American Trucking Association and uh, uh, representing uh, UPS uh, as a member of our panel today. And so what, what I'm going to do is lob out a couple of softballs just for these guys to, to get started on, and then we're counting on those of you that are here representing uh, the various media outlets that you'll have some questions and, and uh, that you'll want to ask of these guys. So let me just, you know, the, the obvious. We're here, in effect, bringing attention to the need for infrastructure and how it supports the movement of freight. Why don't we start with the easiest of the questions? I mean, do you guys have any sort of real world examples or, or Bill and, and, and Pat, given the, I guess I'll call it the highly sophisticated companies you work for, do you actually track and calculate some of the economic impacts that you see from sort of infrastructure inadequacies, uh, delays in getting your freight moved? And, and Phil, you're obviously the sort of the leading intermodal person on this, working at the ports and, and moving across roads and bridges in this country, you know, the way uh, our, our nation's sort of inadequate response to date has started to impact the, you know, the services that you guys provide. You want to take a stab at that, Bill? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll start off. <clears throat> thanks, Bill, and thanks for having me here. Uh, a couple of things I would just comment on, obviously, is a, from a FedEx perspective, we, we see uh, infrastructure uh, opportunities in all spaces, air, ground, y you name it. We kind of, on the all of our operating companies kind of deal in many different avenues on a daily basis. I would just say one, one couple, of, couple of key points. Number one, we know we all have operating cost challenges that, uh, that we use to work around infrastructure challenges. A couple of highlights I would just say just from the ATRI meeting, again, I'm on the board of ATRI, American Truck Association, the Research Institute. A couple of numbers there. I mean, in 2013, $9 billion was the cost to our industry on the trucking side due to congestion in the U.S., $9 billion. And that's about $141 million of lost, uh, uh, lost hours of productivity. So just give you an idea of kind of what we deal with on a daily basis to work around these initiatives, uh, these challenges. So I would say there's a couple of points right there that, uh, that uh, really kind of, to me, when I saw those, I mean, we know what we deal with. When I saw the cumulative number, it's pretty, pretty significant. Okay. Bill? Yeah, I mean, you know, the highway infrastructure to our businesses and to America is the arteries and veins and blood vessels that transport life-saving and life-sustaining blood to the body. I mean, we just learned just the other day that the average human heart pumps about 2,000 gallons of blood a day across some 60,000 miles of veins and arteries and blood vessels in the body. And you have one minute stoppage, blockage, even a partial blockage, and it creates disruption in the way the body functions. Well, the same is true with the highway infrastructure. America depends on not just trucking, but our intermodal partners as well to deliver everything they need, want, and desire for their lives every day. And we have to do that dependent upon a highway system that will allow us to operate efficiently, productively, and safely so that we can deliver for America. And right now, the state of America's highways need a great deal of attention. We need surgery. We need major surgery. We need open heart surgery on our highway system because it is in that dire of a, of a condition. Pat? Phil, you're scaring me. I'm taking my pulse. Right? <laughs> no, no, really, yeah. <laughs> uh, Bill, but thanks for the question. And, and yes, it, we do have some examples that, that are real life. And, and, and let, me, let me reiterate a couple of things that these two gentlemen have said, is that, that, is that the, the nation's highways and, and the intermodal facilities are the lifeblood of what we do. And frankly, what we do is provide the goods to the people in the country. And, and, and we're a, a key part of keeping America competitive around the world because our goods compete with goods from everywhere. And our ability to move those safely and efficiently and cost effectively is critically important. So let me, let me uh, use one number that we, that, we, uh, that we found just within our company at UPS. So if, if we have our drivers, every driver every day stuck in traffic in congestion for five minutes, at the end of the year, that adds up to $105 million that we have to take out of our pocket with no production. So that, uh, that, ha that puts a severe strain on our ability, not just at UPS, but uh, in America, to be competitive in moving goods uh, throughout this country. You know, we, uh, uh, 
in my prior life, we, we did some, we think, good things out in, in, uh, in my home state of Kansas on, on infrastructure investment. It just seemed growing up as a son and grandson of a trucker that it was the thing to do. Uh, I have been surprised at the, at the challenge we faced in, in sort of moving the needle over on Capitol Hill. Uh, if anything, there are moments when I worry that we're, we're being viewed as almost, uh, uh, well, you know, overplaying the hand, uh, uh, demanding uh, action on infrastructure. What, have you guys got any advice or, or, or clarity as to uh, how, how we could do a better job, the collective sort of energy of all those that care about uh, infrastructure investment? What are, what are we missing or, or what could we do to make a better case for getting on with getting this done? In a, in a sort of a responsible, <clears throat> fully funded manner? I, I would say from my perspective, we talk about this internally, it's really about changing the, the debate. Right? It's not about uh, you know, potholes and congestion and being late for an event this evening. Really, it's about jobs, the economy, mm -hmm. and really quality of life for everyone involved. I mean, if you think about that, just uh, being caught in traffic every day and working around these issues, it's really a quality of life of how much time you get to spend at home with your family and so forth because of these issues. So it's a, if you look at it from that perspective, it really is a, is, it's a, it's a very important issue for our, for our country, uh, our competitiveness. Uh, but really, to me, it's about changing the debate. Change the debate from just about potholes and, and so forth and tie it to it's really an opportunity to improve our economy, improve jobs, improve our nation's competitiveness for the long term and the quality of life. Okay. All right. <clears throat> You know, I, I would concur with what Bill just stated in the fact that the focus has to be taken away from potholes and maintenance items on our highway system to productivity and how it impacts the American life and the quality of life. I mean, if you just take a survey, e even in our own company, and, and we ask our employees, how valuable is it to be able to leave home 30 <coughs> minutes later in the morning and spend that 30 minutes with your family and your children as they get off to school and start their day? And the same is true on the back end of the day. How much... How valuable is it to you to be able to, to get home congestion-free and to get to your families? I mean, that, that's an important part. And, and then just to echo that these incredible men and women that we've elected to serve us here in Washington, D.C., to represent all of our communities and all of our states, they have a tremendous job to do. And I salute them for, first, their desire to serve us as a, as a people, and, and secondly, the, the hard decisions that they have to make on our behalf. But they have to pull their chairs up close to the table on this highway infrastructure issue and make some hard decisions to better America. And, uh, you know, the highway motor fuel tax has not been adjusted since 1993. Over two decades that it's just been left to deteriorate and not go toward our highway system. We have to effectively address that. And we'll talk more about that, I'm sure, as this panel goes on. Pat, you well, know? I, think, I think the key is, is uh, involvement uh, of everyone. And, and we see that when we go out into the states. The folks uh, all over America understand the, the value of infrastructure. They understand the value of a, of a road without potholes or a, a bridge that's safe. <coughs> and so I think, uh, I think the key here in Washington is to involve uh, as many groups as we possibly can, because I can't hardly think of a a group of people that isn't affected uh, negatively by a crumbling infrastructure, which is what we have. And, and, and on top of that, we have to get beyond the notion that we've just got to fix the potholes. Uh, you know, over the next decade, uh, the trucks that we run every day are going to need to drive about 50 percent more miles mm -hmm. to carry the additional freight that, that, the, that, the company, that the country requires. So we've got to get beyond the maintenance and the pothole issue and think about uh, added capacity, and that's going to take that's going to take investment. Well, I was I was struck by uh, Phil's comments about the the whole congestion free. That that's not a concept anyone in this room is really familiar with. Yeah. Phil, yeah. Congest, congestion free in this town is something we don't we don't understand. <laughs> well. Now, there obviously for for again all the modes, our mode uh, safety is an, an element of this as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and and again, the the, the kind of efficient. Uh, uh, you know, well-funded program we're seeking has a safety element to it as well. Um, anyone want to? Yeah, it? I mean, I think in, in our business, everything we do as an organization every day is all about safety. The first thing we start the day with every day is about safety. There's not a person in our industry that doesn't take the seriousness of that. And again, infrastructure and safety are very much correlated. So we're, uh, 
we think it's, it's, it's vitally important for our, for, our, for our business. And I will just say also another issue there on, on, on that kind of touching on what Pat talked about, you know, by the year 2035, I think that from a 2010 baseline from some stats that were out there, is the number of uh, the, the, uh, the tonnage on the highways is going to double by the team between now and 2035. So we have infrastructure challenges today, okay, and you take that and you kind of build that towards a double the capacity on the, on, the, on the tonnage that's out there. Obviously, that's a challenging environment. So we've got to make moves today to address those issues. So I think that's really something to me that is vitally important is that because we know that from a, from a project to get a highway started and built and complete, it takes many years. Okay, and when 2035 is going to be here before we all know it, so we need to make, make these appropriate moves right now from a funding perspective, uh, the decision perspective, and, and move it forward so we can get working towards uh, the future so that, as I always say, so that our kids that are out there, when, they have their, when they're running their business and so forth, uh, they're dealing with an environment that's not congested. And again, going back to the original comments, it's about quality of life and competitiveness for our country uh, long term. All right, Bill, thanks. Senator, uh, I'm Bill Graves, head of the American Trucking Association. Thank you very much for coming over and seeing us today. We, we had Senator Blunt stop by for just a few minutes earlier. Uh, Senator Blumenthal is the, the chairman of the Surface Transportation Subcommittee, and uh, we are discussing in the midst of a panel devoted to freight movement. This is a trucking group. We're going to have an intermodal panel uh, made up of rail and ocean going and truck uh, uh, here in just a little bit, but uh, given what is transpiring with the announcement last night from the EPW and the role that your committee now plays in framing up something on the Senate side, and we've heard from the administration. Um, we're anxious to just hear your thoughts on where we're headed in making the kind of investment in infrastructure that uh, probably everyone in this room is anxious to see. But thank you for coming over. Thank you. Senator. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad that you've heard from my friend and colleagues uh, Senator Blunt, because he and I really view ourselves as a team, and I'm hoping that transportation will be viewed very much on a bipartisan, nonpartisan basis. For the reason that you just mentioned, our nation really has to make an investment in surface, rail, really transportation as a whole. And uh, if I have some points just to highlight, multimodal, intermodal transportation I think is key to our future, not just uh, in terms of surface, but really in linking all of the vital arteries that we have as a nation. I see it as a means not only to make America more efficient, more viable as a competitor globally, but also as a way to put America back to work mm -hmm. and a source of jobs and economic growth. I don't need to sell anyone in this room on the importance of that investment, I am absolutely sure. But uh, I, we do need your advocacy and your activism, your voices and your faces. And we need the, them on both sides of the aisle. And just to be really frank, I think it will take a very strong effort to make that EPW bill a reality. It's going to be marked up this week. Uh, your influence and impact is going to be absolutely key in this effort. I see it in my own state of Connecticut. You may know I've been pretty vocal about Metro North, about the passenger and commuter service in the northeastern area, the busiest rail artery in the country. Very profound and urgent problems resulting in deaths, four of them at Spite and Dival, injuries in Bridgeport, Connecticut, as well as there, derailments that have disrupted traffic, outages that have stopped the railroads from running, a failure of investment, also a failure in management. Fortunately, we've now received new management. Joe Giletti, who's taken over Metro North, I think uh, is a new and good beginning, but we're going to need to see management changes throughout the railroad that serves the Northeast, I think, and I'm hoping that there will be greater safety and reliability in passenger rail, but also in freight. We're very much aware in the Northeast about the dangers that are posed by current tank cars that transport hazardous materials, crude oil, ethanol, other kinds of potentially dangerous materials, the need to invest in new tank cars, higher standards, but also in the tracks that carry those cars. 
present tracks simply cannot be trusted to carry those cars. Again, not telling you anything you don't know, but just to tell you that I am committed to do whatever I can to make sure that that investment is made and that it does link rail, roads, shipping, and, and air, even though it's not within my jurisdiction. Aviation, uh, tremendously important. So uh, thank you for being here. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'm still very much in a learning mode. I took over this committee just a matter of months ago, and uh, I'm very proud that we're going to have more hearing coming up in uh, just days and weeks away, and I urge you to suggest areas where we should be shining a light, because I think raising consciousness and awareness is really important in the public so that people know what the reasons are that trails, trains are derailed or delayed or that there are these kinds of incidents, both good and bad, that highlight the importance of uh, transportation. Thanks very much. Senator, we appreciate that very much. Thank, Thank you, you for coming by and seeing us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now, uh, I don't want to get in the front of any of you that have a question you want to ask. So if there is one, let me know. Otherwise, we're just going to keep keep going on down the road with our uh, with our conversation. So, okay, we were just we were talking. I'm sorry. Please. Um, considering we're seeing little traction for an actual big service transportation spend, um, what are your companies doing to uh, hedge your bets to in preparation that we might not see a true four or five year bill for who knows maybe a year or two? I'm gonna I'm gonna try to repeat. The question is is given that there just doesn't seem to be a lot of traction developing for a significant infusion of, of, uh, of new money, especially in infrastructure investment, or the companies doing anything specifically to, uh, to sort of assist or prepare for that, 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 uh, that event? Yeah, yeah let, me, let me take that one on. Uh, again, we first and foremost uh, uh, hope that we, have, we see a long-term bill this, this period. That's our number one objective. We also believe the, the, the bill, obviously, uh, you know, the, we, know the, we understand the funding challenges in the, in the current environment. But again, as I think as Phil said, you know, first and foremost, we are a proponent of the of the fuel tax. It's the most efficient. It's the most. Uh, it's there, and so we support from a FedEx perspective. We support an increase in the fuel tax. We also support an indexing to that uh, to that fuel charge. Uh, we also believe that whatever bill comes out is got to have some productivity enhancement opportunities. You know, again, we've we've talked about uh, from our perspective the. Uh, for, you know, again, the tw go, back, go back to the doubling of volume between now and 2035 on the highways. You know, so we can fund the highway bill, have a good six-year bill. If we don't ad address that issue there, the, the challenge will continue on congestion. So we need to find other ways. And I, I, I say we have a solution that's between the partial carriers, the LTL carriers. We can take our current twin 28s and make it twin 33s and absorb almost 18 percent of that future growth that is coming within that equipment. So we're we're very uh, we spent a lot of time on this issue because we firmly believe the importance of, it is, uh, of what it is to our, to, our, to our country and our infrastructure. Uh, with all that said, uh, you know, if there's no bill uh, that comes out of this, uh, we need to be prepared and we always stay prepared to make sure that we have the appropriate uh, staffing equipment to work around those inefficiencies that are out there. And again, uh, again but it's cost and that cost gets added on to, uh, to customers, the shipping public and so forth. So again, we think there's, uh, you know, we, we're encouraged that we'll see a bill. We'll plan to make sure that we have the ability to, to work for our customers that we do every day to work around that. But again, a couple of solutions I firmly believe, you know, we talk a lot about the funding challenges, and there's many discussions on how you, how you can do it long term and so forth. But we firmly believe that the highway fuel tax, I think it's 1% of the administration goes to cover it. Everything else goes to the, uh, to the, to the infrastructure, and that is something that we firmly believe needs to be uh, added on to, right? <clears throat> Continued and, uh, and and index it as well, so we don't have when inflation takes on, it kind of covers the cost of inflation. So, Matt, Phil, you want to respond to yeah, that? Let me add on to that, if I may, and and to take this a little bit different approach to that. Mm -hmm. and, I, and that is, I think that that there is an acknowledgement that uh, a long-term bill is really important. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'll take you all the way back down to the state and local levels, and they, they need to be able to plan mm -hmm. in the future. And so 
these short-term continuing resolution yeah. type activity just doesn't, doesn't allow them to do the things they need to do. And it's not an efficient way for them to run their departments of transportation or provide any of the services that we need to do. So I guess the, the answer to your question, uh, without a bill, uh, we'll fund it some way, and I guess we'll operate the way we are today. But, but we're hopeful, and, and, and very hopeful, that, that, that people recognize that, that, that infrastructure is an investment into the competitiveness of American businesses, and it just must be done. Just to respond to your, your question, what are we doing internally in our businesses to perhaps uh, survive in a period of time where we don't have improvements to the highway infrastructure, where it might be pro prolonged? You know, we've been addressing that issue in our businesses for, for years, frankly. Uh, we, have, uh, we are a very, very resilient industry. We are very resilient uh, business models that you have represented here. Uh, and we are efficient, we are productive, and we incentivize our companies and our employees to, to produce under the circumstances that we have to live with. But you know, frankly and really, we, we have to look forward and, and, and down the road. There's only so, met, so much water that can be wrung out of a, a washcloth. And then there's no more drops coming out. The efficiencies that are incorporated in our businesses today are, are Lean Six Sigma, gold standard. We have to look forward. If we want America to be number one, if we want our highway infrastructure to be number one, if we want our economy to be world class, we have to have a highway infrastructure that supports such a system, mm -hmm. simply. Hi, uh, thanks for your time. Eric Coolish with American Shipper Magazine. One thing that I'm curious about, you mentioned about that it, the American public um, and even lawmakers intuitively get the importance of infrastructure, but at the end of the day, how do they? How do you get them mobilized at the grassroots level to have any effect on anything? You know, you don't see people doing picket signs for transportation the way they do for, you know, gun rights or Medicaid or Social Security or taxes issues. Um, and when those come up, and, and a host of other things that are always in the news and people are uh, mobilizing for. So, you know, until you kind of get that, you know, how does how can you get that to, to happen? In, Eric's, Eric's question is essentially that uh, that uh, infrastructure investment doesn't doesn't seem to generate the buzz, the mobilizing uh, people to to take up arms, if you will, like a lot of the other uh, sort of key issues that find their way over to Capitol Hill. So the question is, is how do you how do you do that? I mean, I, I say one way we do it is we continue with the ATA initiatives, mm -hmm. the uh, the NAS tracks, and the uh, all the different uh, uh, organizations that are out there that. Uh, that are impacted to a degree by, by infrastructure. I think the industry does a really good job of kind of uh, showing up on time, delivering, and so forth, which kind of uh, holds back that kind of the, uh, the, the daily person every day out there kind of seeing the impact of it. But I think uh, as we've got to continue to educate because at the end of the day, like I said, that 2035 stat is pretty, pretty large, and that will result in more time in cars and so forth. Uh, so we just got to use all our organizations, all the every avenue and opportunity to continue to, uh, to educate everyone. I mean, I think I think it's clear that the, the uh, Congress and the Senate understand it. I think there's a lot of discussion this time on uh, that's out there pretty dramatically on what's coming to a head here, because again, I think they're very very well aware that by the end of the this summer, the uh, Highway Trust Fund could be insolvent, and we've got to solve that. But more importantly, it's a longer term issue, right? That we got to solve the, what's the correct funding. And, uh, and how do we fund it appropriately so that jobs, the economy continue on. So I think it's really an education and continue the focus. I couldn't agree more. Uh, we have to continue as an industry to educate the general public of the essentiality that we play in their very lives. You know, we have to relate the fact of what are we going to do in a situation in an environment with a, a continuing deteriorating highway system and how it impacts American lives. And the, and the truth of the matter is, we can do all the things we can do to make our businesses more efficient, more productive, but it comes an end. And the American consumer then picks up the tab because it shows up on the shelves when they go to per make a purchase. I was asked the other day, not, a month or two ago in a, in a presentation, they couldn't understand. They said, Mr. Burke, why do your trucks have to operate in the daytime when, when we're out there on the highway system? 
going, taking our children to school or taking them to a ball game. Can't you just run at night and on the weekends? And I looked over at that individual and I said, you know, have you ever had a loved one in the hospital that needed medications? In our company, we transport two medications, Zepigen and Nupigen. And then the hypodermic needle ready to be administered to a patient that's dying of cancer or kidney disease. We need to deliver those goods when the patient needs it, not when it's convenient. And we have to have a highway infrastructure system that allows that. Anything, Pat? Uh, I would follow just a little bit with telling you that uh, you are right. It, it's difficult to build the, the enthusiasm for picketers and those sorts of things. But I will tell you that out in the states uh, over the last few years, there have been a number of states that would uh, typically not uh, raise the fuel tax, for example, but they made the case to the folks mm -hmm. and they said, this is what we yeah. need to do. These are the roads that need to be repaired and we need to upgrade our infrastructure. And they've made some, some really tough decisions and then I think the right decisions. And so maybe that can translate into Washington. Yep. I don't know if any of you, oh, I'm sorry. I was, I was about to say, question to the panelists is why is uh, tolling existing interstates a bad idea? You want to go first or you want me to go? I'll be happy to answer your question. Number one, the highway system that would be tolled, the existing highway system has already been paid for. Two, tolling in, in, in essence is uh, in that scenario would be a double form of double taxation. Thirdly, you know, tolls, as, as Bill pointed out a moment ago, not very efficient way to fund the highway system. About 22% to 25% of the collections would go to run the toll administration, whereas the current system of the Federal Motor Fuel Tax takes less than 1% actually, it's just slightly less than 1% of the collections, and the balance of it goes direct to the highway system. Now, how would you run your household? What decision would you make? Would you make a decision that would cost your household and your private business 22% of the collection or less than 1%? And that's all we're asking the federal government to do, to make the right decision for America. Bill, Pat? I think you covered it quite well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, I, I, will, I, I want to chime in because yeah. some of you have seen me say, I, I have, have always wanted to pose that question, why is it that members of Congress feel comfortable asking the average American to pay more than they otherwise need to. And I just, if, if the answer is because we politically can't get it done, then that's just, to me, unacceptable. I mean, that's, you know, you ran for office, you agreed to make some tough, hard decisions, and if that happens to be one of them, so be it. Uh, telling folks to pay us more through tolls or any other form and fashion of infrastructure funding, I think it's just, it's just uh, you know, maybe it's my history in public service, and, but uh, I just don't accept that answer. Um, There's one other very important thing to, to remark on about tolls. It creates something that, is, that may be an unintended consequence, and that is diversion. Diversion away from a toll onto a less safe highway into perhaps neighborhoods and uh, communities that otherwise that freight and traffic would be better handled on, a, on, a, on an interstate system. So don't, don't discount the diversion factor when you think about tolls. I also think tolling is just one of many ideas of everyone trying to figure out how do we, how do we fund the infrastructure. So it's one of many opportunities. And again, the, I think, again, the, the fuel tax today has proven to be a very, very uh, uh, efficient way to do it. Obviously, if I think if it was indexed years ago, we probably wouldn't be having as much of the debate that we have today. So we need to make sure that we use a very efficient way of capturing it. Everyone use a fee. everyone that used the highways, use our roads, uh, are paying for it. And there's also, everybody says, well, the, the revenue is going down from, the, from that tax, I mean, from the uh, fuel tax. I said, well, there's also other ways of going about whether you have a re registration fee, right? I mean, where every car, every truck in the country pays a small fee that's for using our highway systems. That way there you get the electric vehicles, the hybrid vehicles, and so forth, which is the reason we've seen the revenue uh, dr uh, decrease. So how do you capture that segment? That's, that's, the, big, that's the big opportunity. Okay. Ollie.
available in additions or alternatives to Okay. Ollie's, Ollie's question is, uh, he knows that ATA has been uh, advocating fuel tax increase, but that, uh, that we even ourselves acknowledge that that might be a heavy political lift, and therefore we were taking a hard look at perhaps some other, some other funding options and uh, wanted to know if we could, could uh, break news here today by giving him a, a story about what we'd come up with. But I, I don't think we can do that, but I think uh, you have the right people to respond to it. Interesting you asked that question because we all three of us here happen to be on the committee that's, that's <laughs> reviewing those options. Um, we have been meeting and we have been reviewing a, a whole host of different funding options and, and unfortunately I'm not going to be able to break any news for you here today, but uh, we will meet again soon at our leadership meeting uh, uh, later this, uh, I guess early next week and sort of finalize some of the ideas that we have. And, but the whole goal is to, is, is to broaden our horizons in case the uh, the obvious choice of raising the fuel tax and index it to, so that people pay for the miles that they drive on the on the on the roads doesn't uh, doesn't work out, we'll have some other things that we can use and that we can support to uh, get the appropriate amount of funding. Is that it? Yeah, I think what's important is the fact that the industry took on this initiative and put some of the brightest minds that we have and uh, in the industry to focus on. What, what is life like should the motor fuel tax not be the vehicle by which we fund the highway trust? Um, so that's, a, that's been the issue. But what's been um, remarkable about it, as we think about all these innovative ideas and ways to do it, nothing comes up and nothing meets the same uh, criteria and measure as does the current system of making some reasonable adjustment with indexing to the motor fuel tax. The, uh, the, the question is uh, basically, uh, given the, the, the constraints on our infrastructure, isn't it incumbent upon the, the industry to do the best job they can utilizing uh, highways and bridges at, at off-peak times uh, to, in order to still keep stuff moving but, but do it in a, in a less congested fashion? I, I, I say a couple examples of that. Obviously, uh, I think the trucking industry and the intermodal is Bill. Uh, and Ed put an article out uh, this week, you know, trying to work together to make sure we put his, put put a highway on the rail and be work as a, as a, as a as the industry together. I think that's one area of opportunity there. The example I gave, the 33 footers, is a way of absorbing. How do I I can absorb 18 percent of existing volume going forward with existing with existing number of miles on the highway and, and number of units on the highway. There's two good examples there. I think of uh, of ways we can do that. You know, one of, one of the challenges from in the in the, uh, in, the in our network is we got to continue to move our volume around uh, this country uh, in all avenues uh, to, to to all reaches, and you do that by using the highway system conversely 24/7. Um, and again, some of the recent challenges in the hours of service, you know, with our back-to-back -back one to five hours, probably a bigger issue in the truckload than it is for an LTL carrier. Uh, you know, you know put, puts a lot of that uh, those miles back in during the during the daytime. Versus, versus the middle of the night. So those are the things that we all have to uh, uh, deal with as far as re uh, regulations. You know, and we, so we have to manage our fleet to those rules. You know? mm -hmm. well, we, need, we do need to see flexibility mm -hmm. and expanded hours of shipping and receiving by our consignees mm -hmm. and our shippers. And we need to have a more sensitive approach to our driver's times and the respect that they pay and how quickly do we get turned around at a shipper or a consignee. All of those things factor into productivity. 
but it, you, you can't limit productivity. I mean, you have to really take the, the, the blinders off and look straight forward at a 360-degree angle at productivity in this industry. And the shipper and the consignees are one dynamic of, of that vision. I, I, I would tell you that uh, from our company's perspective, if we could, if we could shift a, a load moving across the country from the daytime in congestion to the night, by golly, we would have done that yeah. some time ago. Uh, in addition to that, if we can put it on the back of a, a rail car, we've probably done that already. Mm -hmm. or or even on the ocean or, or the waterway. So uh, we have folks that, that continually uh, look at the network and find exactly what you're talking about to try and do it. But the vast majority of the things that drive our, our uh, networks are our customers, our customers' needs. And so we have to, mm -hmm. we have to figure out how to meet their needs mm -hmm. in, in a fashion that, that works for them. Avery, you want to ask one? Oh, I'll have to ask a different one because it's pretty much the Obama administration proposal obviously is, is pretty much dead on arrival, certainly to the extent that it wasn't adopted at the EPW um, one, it's certainly not going to get adopted in the House. But there obviously are opportunities for elements of that to be proposed as amendments or otherwise to find their way. So are you are there elements of the administration proposal you would like to see, or conversely, are there some elements of the proposal that you would definitely not want to see come up as an amendment? A Avery was just kind enough to to uh, to uh, comment that the president's proposal is dead on arrival. So you heard heard it from Avery here first today. Uh, <laughs> but he was he was uh, he was asking if there are elements in the proposal that are could be favorably looked at uh, to be included going forward. And are there things that you know we talked a little bit about the tolling piece, but other things that are, are, I guess, definitely not things we'd like to see. I, I want to comment myself that, um, you know, I still think this president has done a great service by continuing to talk about infrastructure. We haven't always, you know, agreed with, with some of the things he's proposed, but he's probably talked about it more than any president that I can recall uh, in a number of years. And I think uh, today the fact that we're here meeting, having, you know, discussing infrastructure this week. The fact that, that uh, uh, EPW uh, put out their proposal last night on, uh, you know, on the heels of the president's proposal a few weeks ago, um, I mean, it does, it, it is helpful, I think, to just stimulate the conversation and the discussion. And I think uh, when the when the Senate, uh, when the when the Congress gets down to business of trying to find the money they need to shore up the Highway Trust Fund, and especially trying to find the hundred billion dollars roughly that'll be needed for the the proposal that just came out, you know. We might be surprised what sort of thinking uh, emerges from that on some, you know, things like indexing or, or perhaps fuel tax increases. I know they say today that there's no way, but um, when they start scrounging around trying to find a hundred billion dollars and shifting away from the most part from users onto the general fund, it could it could change some of their thinking. But it's. Uh, my opinion. Anything that uh, strikes you guys that was was proposed in the president's bill that we would like and would keep in it or anything uh, beyond the tolling piece? Uh, um, I, I would just say in any bill, when you have multiple variations going on in the, out there in the industry today, there's, 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 there's uh, opportunities in every bill, right? And kind of how do you bring the best together for a long-standing bill? But at the end of the day, to me, it can, still comes back to the funding of any any solution comes back to funding. How do we how do we fund it long term? Uh, and again, I think we had the we had the best solution for, the, for to get us through a, this period where we have a, uh, a infrastructure crisis and we need to get the right funding today to get it taken care of in the long term. And over long term technology, there's going to be uh, technology change over the coming years and so forth that, you know, down the road. But right now, this is the most efficient way to kind of uh, to solve our, our, our country's challenge. <clears throat> funding, funding through tax reform? Does anybody mm -hmm. think that's a likely scenario? Well, it's in the president's bill, you know, um, but the details aren't, aren't there as to how that would actually play out. And uh, I think we'd have to know, as industry, we'd have to know a great deal more about the, the details of, of that component of his bill uh, before we could uh, pass judgment on it. And we, we firmly support the uh, uh, a change in the uh, U.S. business tax uh, rules and so forth. We, we believe that uh, the tax rate for U.S. corporations is too high; needs to be reduced. It needs to be needs to be uh, uh, 
resolved to the point where we, again, continues our U.S. global competitiveness. Uh, and again, so uh, we, we firmly believe that it, it needs to be, uh, the, the, the tax bill needs to be adjusted uh, for, that, for those issues versus, uh, versus other discussions. Okay. All right. I think we're going to call it the last one. Mm -hmm. Question is is uh, as we segue into our next panel, it's a good good setup. What opportunities do you see in your businesses to uh, embrace more multimodal freight movement? Well, I'll just say from our business, I know in the past uh, past uh, recent years here, three four years, we have uh, made a significant shift to using the rail in our business. So again, I think we have taken a a, a very large step forward, making sure that we move volume the appropriate way across this uh, across our country with our line haul and again so we're, we're we think we've made some very good steps there we work hand in hand with our rail providers uh, on schedules and, and timing and uh, if, it, if it aligns uh, to our service needs we will certainly consider it you know we're very involved in Intel motor from the waterway standpoint in our business where we we take cargoes that are out of gauge and super loads that can't move on certain highways and connect them by waterways so that we can then retrieve them at a later date and somewhere downstream and move them inland we move uh, on average in Charleston South Carolina about 2500 rail moves a week uh, the rails have been our business partners uh, for years and years and years and continue to grow in that business and we serve Major customers, for example, uh, Alcoa Aluminum and Michelin and um, BMW and Mercedes-Benz and, and many others, very successfully with a surface and rail connection. Um, so, yeah, uh, we see an expansion of that going forward. But what, what needs to be understood is as we expand the other modes in our industry, the need for trucking does not decrease. Over time, it continues to increase. Currently, we, we, we transport 68.5% of all the tonnage that is produced, manufactured, shipped, imported, and exported in this nation. And as we continue to expand all modes of transportation and we evolve intermodalism, our need will grow in 2014 or 2024 that we'll need, we'll be handling 71% of all the tonnage. So that's, that's why we can't take our eyes off of infrastructure. And to that, I think rail is vitally important for the long term. But again, as Phil said, the trucking ton is going to continue to grow. Uh, so it really needs to be a uh, combined effort for, to, uh, from an industry perspective to, to uh, really push, continue to move this forward. Again, I, I always say that you know, transportation, everyone, it's, it's, it's by far, it's not a luxury. This is a necessity yeah. for, our, for our country. So. <clears throat> And Bill makes a great point. It, it, it isn't an either or, it, but it's an and. Yep. And of course, we're significant users of the rail. And uh, you know, the better the railroads uh, operate, the better we do. And mm -hmm. so, we, we encourage uh, investment in that infrastructure, as well as, as Phil said, you know, uh, more freight on the rail means more truck use on either end. So, yep. okay, appreciate you three guys giving us your time today. Thanks for being with us. Give our panelists a, a round of applause. Right. Thanks. So uh, glad to be here. Joining me, as you can see, are um, Governor Graves, who you heard from the last panel. We have next to him Ed Hamburger, who's president and CEO of the Association of American Railroads. And to my immediate right is Kurt Noggle, who's the president and CEO of the American Association of Port Authorities. Along with IANA, ATA, AAPA and AAR have worked under the umbrella of a freight stakeholder coalition for at least 10 plus years now, trying to really uh, uh, flesh out the issues for uh, freight transportation providers. So uh, I think what you'll hear today is, is a bit more of that um, uh, interaction that we've seen over the last 10 plus years. The major challenge I think that we face together is working with Congress and the administration to ensure that adequate programs and associated and sustainable funding for those programs are developed to support the maintenance and enhance, enhancements <coughs> excuse me, of the desperately needed um, U.S. transportation infrastructure system. Uh, Boston Consulting Group recently published a study, I believe it was in April, um, on global manufacturing, and it showed that the United States now places second in the world 
for manufacturing competitiveness behind China. And quite frankly, I'm surprised it's not lower than that. So it's nothing that you haven't heard from the first panel, but certainly reinforces what, um, what our goal is. Uh, when we elect to delay improving our freight transportation network and other critical infrastructure, we're opting out of invent investing in our country's economic competitiveness. And again, you heard that echoed quite a bit in the first panel. I think we're going to start today with some general statements from each of our three panelists, and then we'll move into some Q&A that I'll drill down a little bit further into multimodal infrastructure wants and needs. So, Kurt, you want to kick us off? Thanks, Joni. Uh, first off, I want to thank uh, the governor and ATA for hosting uh, us, including AAPA, in this, in this forum. I think it's a great opportunity as part of Infrastructure Week to talk about uh, freight transportation and the vital importance that uh, moving goods plays to our economy. Do you wanna Should we hold that thought? Be happy to yield to the senator, the senator? from uh, Delaware. We've been expecting you. <laughs> <laughs> we just got started. Hi, <laughs> Senator. You. Senator, would you like to come up and address our group? We just started the intermodal panel, so you've got everyone captive. Don't you? I apologize for being a little bit late. We have a hearing. Dr. Corbin and I hold a hearing with the Homeland Security Government Affairs Committee with our Government Affairs hat on, uh, working with the Department of Defense trying to figure out, after all these years, 20 years, they've been supposed to be uh, auditable. And uh, they uh, still aren't there. And maybe three years from now, they will be. And we want to make sure that uh, they, they get there. And so we, uh, I left the hearing in, in mid-flight. But uh, I think we're starting to make a little progress. But just give me a, a, a minute or two on, a minute, not even a minute on, what do we hope to accomplish here? How's it going? Well, we are. This is this is uh, the trucks, the rails, the ports, the the, the whole shipping community represented here, uh, emphasizing uh, infrastructure week. Our part in in uh, in making sure there's an awareness of uh, the great need this country faces in terms of infrastructure investment amongst all modes. Uh, this panel is is specifically focused on the fact that uh, we work. To, every now and then you would know it from the way we sort of jab at one another, but we work together very closely and I think... Sort of like in the Senate. What's that? <laughs> like in the Congress. Yeah, yeah, pretty much like that. But there's a, there's a, there's a real uh, strong working relationship, uh, partnership, and an understanding of, of what needs to get done, and we're trying to figure out how to help you all, uh, you know, push the ball over the goal. That's great. But yeah, just to follow up uh, briefly on, 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 that, on that point, and I have some other things I, I want to say. Um, I, uh, we're, we're not all experts, as you know, in the House or Senate on everything. Or some things we're knowledgeable, more knowledgeable about than, uh, than, uh, than, than others. But one of the things that's real helpful for us when we come to an issue like the one transportation, how to move people and goods, one of the things enormously helpful for us is when the, uh, uh, the folks that are friendly rivals, if, if you will, to some extent, can actually come to us and say, we may disagree on some things, but there's a, a lot we agree on, and here's what it is, and, and you should um, maybe do that. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's real helpful. Uh, I, I like to tell this, uh, this uh, story. Um, I don't know, 10 years or so ago, I was invited to participate in a, um, an event up in uh, Mackinac Island, up in, uh, off of Michigan. Anybody ever been there? Mackinac Island. And uh, I, uh, this, is, this, is a, this is a story about um, multimodality. You know, anyway, I, I uh, left my house uh, in Wilmington, uh, Drove my minivan to the uh, to a parking lot not far from the Wilmington train station. I walked from my car to the train station. I took an escalator and went up the uh, the uh, to the platform and walked down the platform. I got on a train that uh, took us down to uh, BWI. Uh, got off at uh, BWI and walked to a shuttle bus which took us to the uh, terminal. Took a, a human one of these uh, you know human movers and you know, they carried us along to, to our uh, gate and walked through the gate, got on an airplane to fly to Traverse City, got off at Traverse City, Michigan, and took a bus to a ferry that carried us across the water to uh, Mackinac Island where we rode a horse-drawn carriage to our hotel. <laughs> <laughs> now, where I come from, we have uh, uh, highways, we have roads, highways, bridges, just like you do wherever you came from. Uh, we have the... Uh, um, Delaware Bay, Delaware River, a lot of ships going up and down there. We have an active, busy port of Wilmington. We have the Chesapeake and Delaware Canal, which cuts our state uh, literally in half. We have a couple of railroads that uh, do a lot of business through our state, uh, uh, Norfolk Southern and CSX. Uh, we have uh, two interstate highways, I-95, 495. For a little state, uh, we got a lot going on and on the transportation side. And uh, 
if we're going to be successful as a nation uh, economically, there's a lot of things we need and, and can do, but one of the things for sure is uh, to realize that we, freight just doesn't move on I-95. It doesn't just move on level 149. It just doesn't move on the C&D Canal. It just doesn't move through our airport or the Philadelphia airport. Uh, it, uh, it doesn't move just on the rails. Uh, it's uh, like my trip to Mackinac Island. Um, it moves uh, on a lot of different modes, a lot of different modes. And the challenge for us, some people think we're going to do a transportation bill. We ought to do a transportation bill it's just to put a lot of people to work who don't have a job. And there's something to be said for that because there's plenty of folks still looking for, for work. And, uh, but in, in this case, if we're smart about it, we won't just build roads, highways, bridges, and do something good for, for transit. We'll figure out how to, to uh, I guess, we're talking about baseball coming over here. How do we actually get the team, uh, uh, how do we enhance the teamwork and so that we have a synergy? And the, uh, the output here is better and bigger than the parts uh, there, uh, thereof. And we have the, uh, the opportunity for the first time. I was talking to Colin from Colin, would you raise your hand? Nice round of applause. This guy works his buns off on it. So give him a nice round of applause. <laughs> he is, uh, uh, I know he doesn't look like much to be this smart and this hard working, <laughs> Colin. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, the only reason I've had any success in my life, I picked the right parents, they had good values, and I, uh, I surround myself with people that are smarter than me. My wife says it's not hard to find them. <laughs> <laughs> Colin's one of them. Colin's one of them. But we have this, uh, actually have a, a section of our transportation bill, which uh, was introduced, was it introduced, I want to say, yesterday? Last night. Last night. Uh, Barbara Boxer, Lee with David Vitter, uh, John Barrasso, orthopedic, orthopedic surgeon who always wanted to be an expert on transportation policy. <laughs> but, uh, and yours truly, yours truly, who's a recovering governor and has actually thought a lot about this transportation stuff, as has your, your, uh, your leader here. But uh, if, if we really want to be successful as a nation, we're going to figure out how to move. Colin actually once told me how much we move every day in terms of the value. What is it, $46 billion? What is it? It's a huge amount of, of, uh, of volume of, of goods uh, that we move and a whole huge volume. Some of the stuff we export. Some of the stuff we're just trying to get together so they can assemble. We can assemble uh, other, other, uh, other uh, uh, products. But uh, whether it's just things that we're making for domestic consumption for here in the, in the NAFTA area or send out in other parts of the world, to the extent we can figure out how to m merge, uh, put, put together our, uh, our goods and figure out how to get to a place where we can export them and do that efficiently, especially in a just-in-time world, uh, we're a lot smarter. And I think we have the opportunity. And a bunch of you in this room have actually been supportive. And one of the reasons why that chapter is in, we have a freight chapter in our, in our bill, is because of your support and encouragement. The key is to not only just make sure we have a chapter in the, the bill, uh, but also to have one that is effective, something that will work and will actually get the job done. And um, I like to say uh, one of my favorite commercials in the last uh, Summer Olympics was this, this commercial you may have seen this on television. Uh, it was women running. It looks like they're doing a, f a 400 meter or something. They're like going around the oval and just flying. And they're coming up to the, uh, to the, uh, the, the, the finish line. And the camera, which is like, has the cameras right on their faces, and they're churning bodies, and their legs just churning to the finish line. And then when they get to the finish line, the camera goes right down to the finish line. And on the track are these words, not the finish line. That's what, not the finish line. Just introducing a bill is not the finish line. It is not the finish line. It is not the end. It is not the beginning of the end. It is, as Winston Churchill famously said, the end of the beginning. And uh, while some good work has been done, a lot of it by Colin and with your, uh, your help, there's a lot more that, uh, that certainly needs to, to be done. Uh, help us. If you think that the stuff we're trying to do is important and it should be protected on the floor of the Senate, that we should have s similar language in the, uh, the House bill, help us. If you think that uh, it ought to be in a, the bill that we finally send to, uh, to the President, that, uh, that we have not just uh, as a placeholder that says it's a uh, freight title, but we want to have something that's real and meaningful and effective, help us. Help us every step of the way. The other thing I would say is uh, at a, uh, a meeting of uh, last um, Wednesday, Senator Reid, our uh, majority leader in the Senate, uh, assembles about every three weeks. Those of us that are uh, committee chairman, we have a, a chairman's luncheon. And uh, Barbara Box was asked by uh, uh, Senator, Lead, uh, Senator Reid to just report a little bit on, uh, on our bill. And she did. I had a chance to say something. And Senator Reid said to uh, Senator Box, he said, well, who's going to pay for all this? And she turned to Senator White and said, he is. <laughs> <laughs> and so he laughed a little bit. He didn't laugh. <laughs> well, he's not going to pay for it. Uh, I'm not going to pay for it. We're all going to pay for it. And we're going to figure out a smart way to, uh, to pay for that. I'm, um, 
again, I'm a recovering governor. I, I come from a school that if things are worth having, they're worth paying for. Uh, I don't like the idea that uh, we have uh, a, we'll see. Can I have your bottles there for a second, please? Can you give me the, your bottles? And would you come around the other side? No lid on that one. Is this a trick? Want a lid on that thing? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> I have one more bottle. Uh, all right, folks. This is a transportation trust fund. All right. You look at it, you would say, oh, there's something in there, but not much. It's just about empty. By August, it'll be empty, largely. This is a general fund of our country. And uh, when this runs out of money, uh, we take money out of the general fund and we pour it into the uh, transportation trust fund. And then uh, when this is empty, we go over here, this is China <laughs> <laughs> or Korea or Japan. And we say, hey, China, how about some money? And they say, well, before we do that, there's some things we'd like for you to do on foreign policy and uh, stop bugging us about our currency and currency manipulation. Get off our back. And so, by the way, stay out of the South China Sea. We have some, you know, you know there, all this is that's sort of connected. We don't want to have to have that discussion with them. And the best way to have, not have the discussion with them is to make sure we don't have to refill this all the time from folks like our friends in China, God bless them, and then fill the, uh, the transportation trust fund. We need to fill out, figure out not how to finance to provide money. We have to fund it. We have to fund it. Now, thank you. Thank you. Now, you are great. <laughs> I couldn't have done that without you. Couldn't have done that without you. The question is, how do, we fill, how do we fill this up without having to count on all these other countries to do the work for us? And um, uh, three times governor, we were governor uh, together uh, for about almost eight years. But uh, during that period of time, uh, we had great eight great great years, economy that strong, 93 to 2001. Bill Clinton was president for those years, as you'll recall. I used to say, with an economy this strong, even I look like I know what I'm doing. And uh, those were good. We had balanced budgets eight in a row, cut taxes seven out of eight. We paid down some of our debt. Our in AAA credit ratings. That was a state that had the worst credit rating in the country in 1977. So we're very proud of going from worst to first. All right. Uh, the uh, I mean, how's a, a good way to, uh, to 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 say this? Three times during my time as governor, I asked the legislature to uh, support um, modest gasoline tax increases. Three times. Once they did it, twice they said no. Uh, once and then when they said no, I'd ask for three cents. We had to be real careful in Delaware. You can in Delaware you can drive to a gas station in Maryland or Pennsylvania or New Jersey that fast. So you don't want to have your prices out of line because people drive that fast to go to another state and buy their gas. So we had to kind of stay uh, pretty close uh, in terms of their price. Uh, one time I tried to raise three cents. The legislature said no. We're having this huge economic recovery. We're cutting other taxes. We're not going to raise the gas tax. So forget it, Governor. Excellency, they call me Excellency when they <laughs> wanted to pimp me. But uh, Excellency. So um, uh, interesting enough, uh, four months later, the Senate Majority Leader, Democrat, but not my friend, uh, he uh, came to me and he said, um, we made a mistake. And I said, what do you mean? And uh, he said, we should have raised the gas tax. And I said, what do you mean we? <laughs> Kim Asabi, you. You should have. You know, why, where were you guys when you should have been? He said, well, should, it was a, I guess it was like a buck 30 or something a gallon. He said, this was a time to do it. I don't think the price of gas is going down to a, a buck 30 a gallon. I bought gas yesterday in Dover for my minivan. And uh, my Chrysler Town and Country minivan that uh, just went over, um, 2001, just went over 366,000 miles. Pretty good, huh? I, I know how to squeeze a dime. <laughs> original engine, original transmission, original owner. But uh, the... Uh, we paid 3.45 a gallon, 3.45 a gallon, at Wawa, and uh, I don't know if the gas is going to turn down a little bit here now that we're approaching the summer season or, or not. But if, uh, if if the price gas ain't going to be a buck thirty later this year, but it may come down a little bit more. And if it does, what I said to my I'm saying to my colleagues, uh, if you go back and look at the federal gas tax we had in place in established in 1993, we said it's going to be 18.4 cents federal. And if you uh, f look at it today, what is the purchasing power of 18.3, uh, 18.4 cents? It's a dime. It's a dime. And meanwhile, the price of, uh, of asphalt, the price of concrete, the price of a lot of stuff that we used to do to put together a transportation system has uh, not uh, stayed, uh, it hasn't dropped. 
if anything, it's, it's, gone, uh, it's gone up. And uh, so I said to my colleagues, maybe the best thing to do for us is in looking at a, a wide range of ways to refill that transportation trust fund, don't discount the, uh, the gas tax. And what I've suggested to them is this. Let's just figure out how to um, uh, restore the purchasing power of the federal gas tax to what it uh, existed in uh, 1994. Uh, don't do that like, like that. Don't do it overnight. But uh, for the next maybe four years, raise the gas tax three or four cents a, a year until uh, we restored the, uh, the purchasing power to where it was in 1994 and then index it going forward. That doesn't solve the, uh, the whole problem because people, fortunately, are buying more energy efficient vehicles. And in some cases, people are driving less. I've got a son who wants to basically get rid of his car and just live in a place where he can just take the train to work or the bus or whatever, or ride, bicycle. Um, and there are other young people, not so young people, who feel that way as well. Who are driving more energy efficient cars are actually driving a bit less. And that uh, diminishes the, uh, the value of the federal gas tax. But there are other, there are all, all other kinds of ideas. Tolling, are interesting ideas on tolling. Road user charges, which are another way of saying uh, vehicle miles traveled. There are um, folks who have ideas for infrastructure banks, and so the president's proposed an idea, and I think Dave Camp is sort of with him, that uh, deals with um, some kind of almost like uh, inc uh, corporate tax, income tax repatriation. There's an element of that, a little bit of like in, in, uh, tax, tax reform uh, on, the, on the corporate side that, that generates some monies for, for, for a There's all kinds of ideas. And um, I would suggest at the end of the day, there is, there's no uh, silver uh, bullet. Uh, but there may be a number of silver BBs, <laughs> all right? A number of silver BBs. Another way to say it, but maybe we could put together kind of a tapestry of, uh, of, of options that together uh, actually cover the, the need here that we have. Another, have you all had lunch yet? Yeah. yeah lunch. How was it? I, I Pretty didn't. good, okay. Um, the, uh, maybe it's like a menu. Think of it like you start off with the appetizer, and then you have the hors d'oeuvre, and then maybe have like um, I don't know dessert. It's may we need we need something right now or real soon, so that we don't run out of money in August. So we need there's a, a near term need, and then there's a like a mid term need and a longer term need. And the idea of having like a multi pronged approach probably makes some uh, some sense. Last point I'd say is this: uh, when uh, I was I was raised, maybe you were as well, is when we have problems, uh, we shouldn't just pretend like we don't. Um, my parents raised me uh, to think uh, this clearly. They gave me at least four great values that I really tried to abide by. Uh, the first of those probably sound like values your parents imparted in you. Number one, figure out the right thing to do and do it. Not the easy thing, not the expedient thing, but figure out the right thing to do. There is a right thing to do here. And it's not the easy thing or the expedient thing to do, but it's the right thing to do. And when, I, when I shared that idea that I just shared with you about the, uh, restoring the purchasing power of the uh, uh, the federal gasoline tax to where it was in 1990. Do it three or four cents a year for four years index. Uh, I was surprised at a number of people in my, uh, if I'd said that like six months ago, I'd have been thrown out of the meeting. And uh, they didn't throw me out of the meeting. No one even threw any food. Uh, so I, uh, I think the, and when I talk to some of my Republican colleagues, I'm starting to get a little, bit, a little better reaction there. But uh, figure out the right thing to do, just do it. Uh, the other thing is treat other people the way I want to be treated. I, that's, we ought to do that. The idea of saying to states, you can't toll or you can't do this or you can't do that, I don't think that makes a whole lot of sense. We should encourage them. They have but more than half the money for, for tax, uh, for transportation projects. You know, we only, we only do, feds do less than half. And for us to tie their hands and say this, you can do, you can do, I don't like that very much. The, uh, the uh, third thing my, uh, my dad taught me especially was uh, uh, to focus on excellence in everything we do. He always say, if it isn't perfect, make it better. And in terms of our transportation uh, system in this country, it ain't perfect. Uh, can we make it better? You bet we sure can. And uh, we can do that really by, by the sense of team. It's teamwork. It's the shared responsibilities. It's team sport. And the last thing uh, that I learned, um, I think I learned in the Navy. I, got my, I was in a P-3 aircraft uh, mission command. I was a Navy flight officer for 23 years, active and reserve, retired Navy captain. And uh, I got to my squadron out on the East Coast, on the West Coast, rather. We were, you know, the Navy P-3 airplanes that we didn't use a lot over in the Indian Ocean to search the, you know, the, uh, this, uh, the remains of, our, of uh, those, all those people in a plane. Uh, uh, but uh, when I got to my squadron on the West Coast, we were the, maybe the worst Navy P-3 squadron in the country, in the world. <laughs> and uh, have you ever heard the TV show? You maybe have seen Mikhail's Navy? Sure. Yeah. Mikhail's Navy, okay. Think of Mikhail's Navy not on PT boats, but think of Mikhail's Navy in airplanes. <laughs> that was us. 
And we could barely spell submarine, much less find them. And uh, four years later, so when I left my squad and moved to Delaware, got an MBA, uh, about, um, I don't know, three or four months after I got to Delaware, I got something in the mail. Came home from, scl from class and opened up my mailbox, and there was a little something in the mail. Uh, about the size of this envelope, or rather this, this napkin. It was, like a little, it was like cardboard or something. It was, and I, I looked and I said, uh, it said, Patrol Squadron 40, Naval Air Station, Moffett Field, California, commanding officer. I thought, oh, I wonder what that is. Maybe they owe me some money, but they didn't. Uh, but I opened up, and inside of it was a Navy Achievement Medal. And uh, my uh, commanding officer uh, said to me, one of about four I had there, he said, I um, um, thought you would like to know that uh, our squadron, your old squadron, uh, just to receive the Battle for Excellence. And, and if you know anything about uh, in the Navy, if you're the best aircraft carrier in the Navy, you get the Battle for Excellence. If you're the best submarine, you get the Battle for Excellence. If you're the best destroyer, you get the Battle for Excellence. If you're the best uh, Navy P3 squadron, you get the Battle for Excellence. And uh, we'd, won, we'd gone from worst to first. And one of the reasons why we did that is because we just didn't give up. We just didn't give up. We had about three commanding officers in a row who made us believe if we would not give up, committed to excellence, committed to excellence, doing what was right, um, if we would not give up, we could accomplish anything. And ultimately, we accomplished some pretty remarkable things. And they, my commanding officer said he thought I had something to do with it, maybe a little something. So I leave with those, uh, with those thoughts. Um, I, uh, some people look at um, adversity, and they say, oh my god, now how are we going to deal with this? And I don't feel that way. That's not the way I do it. I look at adversity. Albert Einstein, what did he say? In adversity lies opportunity. That's what he said. In adversity lies opportunity. I had the uh, graduating class at Delaware State University on Sunday, all of them on their feet, chanting repeatedly, in adversity lies opportunity, because I wanted them to take that with them as they, as they left the graduation ceremony. We got a lot of adversity here. We're running out of money. We don't have the will, political will to do what is, uh, we know what, what needs to, uh, to be done. That's real adversity, but there's real opportunity here. If we will uh, figure out the right thing to do, focus on excellence in everything we do, and just refuse to give up. I'm not going to give up, and I hope that you will be with me as we go through this battle. Thank you so much. God bless you. See you. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Uh, Sorry to interrupt. No. <laughs> Can you follow that act? Well, We're going to try. That, that, that youth hurts, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, should we do a redo? And, Kurt, why don't you yeah, I was start just, us off uh, again? And, I, was, uh, I was just saying that it's. I think it's uh, valuable for us to, uh, to, to meet here this week during Infrastructure Week and really focus in and, and talk about the importance of uh, moving goods and, and freight transportation and its infrastructure and what that means, as we heard earlier uh, in, the, in the, the first panel, in terms of our economy, uh, our jobs, our quality of life, and importantly, our international competitiveness. You know, I think uh, having uh, the, 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 the four organizations uh, together here on the panel shows, I think, a lot of the common challenges that, that we face, certainly the adversity as uh, uh, as the senator mentioned, but a lot of common, we have a lot of commonality. And uh, uh, Joni talked about the Freight Stakeholders Coalition and working together uh, as freight stakeholders to uh, advance our many mutual, many mutual issues. And I think overall, having us collectively here today also really shows and highlights that the freight system does need to be looked at multimodally. Importantly, it needs to be looked at holistically as well. It certainly needs to include the rail lines and the, and the roads and the highways throughout our, throughout our country. It also needs to include the intermodal connections uh, between modes of transportation and including to uh, uh, America's uh, ports. It also needs to include the port infrastructure itself and importantly, the waterside infrastructure that connects us to the global marketplace and those are the federal navigation channels. That all must be looked at when we talk about our freight transportation system. And this multimodal system is becoming more and more critical to our economy. Right now, international trade accounts for over a quarter of our GDP, and that percentage is increasing uh, significantly. Uh, you may have already seen, if not uh, noticed, some of the infographic boards uh, uh, outside here talking about the critical importance of freight transportation infrastructure. Just a couple of, uh, uh, of, of items of note. If investments are not made in the infrastructure, uh, connecting our, 
our, our goods movement uh, system, the cumulative cost to the U.S. economy is just between now and 2020 is going to be over $3 trillion. And in terms of its impact on total trade, over $1 trillion. Those are dramatic numbers. But also significant numbers of jobs are at stake. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, last month, there were almost 10 million uh, Americans unemployed. And if we make the investments that are needed in our transportation infrastructure, it's estimated that we'll create over 3.5 million jobs between now and the, the year 2020. That can make a significant impact on our uh, unemployment situation in this country. And also importantly, that investment will generate over $3,000 per household per year in additional income. That's every household in America, $3,000. Think what that can mean, not only to the quality of life and to our families, but to, uh, to, to the job situation and our uh, quality of life. These are huge, huge impacts, and the, the impact of our freight transportation system literally cannot be uh, overstated. But that system needs to have significant investments uh, made, not only to maintain our competitiveness, but importantly to, to uh, enhance our competitiveness as a nation moving forward. Uh, it was related to earlier, I think Joni uh, uh, touched on it, that the U.S. is no longer uh, really the 800-pound uh, the gorilla in terms of international trade and, and, and the world economy. And if we don't make the investments to compete, that trade, those jobs, uh, and our economic vi vitality will literally pass us by. And I think ultimately, again, as, uh, as our four organizations being here, the recognition is that the multimodal system is a partnership. And I don't think any, certainly any of our organizations or industries are looking for a handout. Uh, but individual modes are doing their part, and I know the governor and, and Ed certainly can talk about the investments that their, their industries are making. In terms of the public ports, uh, uh, our members, uh, as well as their private sector partners, are investing over $46 billion over the next five years, over $9 billion a year in their, uh, in their infrastructure. But what we're not seeing is the, the, uh, the, the, the infrastructure from our federal partners. They're not upholding their end of the partnership in terms of the land side connections, that first mile into and out of uh, port facilities, and then connecting with the roads and the, uh, and the rail lines. Also on the water side, not making the investments needed even to maintain federal navigation channels at their current depths, much less making the investments to deepen and widen them where necessary. We certainly uh, heard uh, uh, encouraging words uh, last Friday that the House and the Senate uh, Conference Committee on Water Resources legislation reached agreement. We're looking forward to seeing the specifics of that legislation, but uh, we do anticipate that we'll see improvements in terms of investments in maintaining and improving our, our water side infrastructure, providing more streamlining and flexibility into that. And I certainly want to commend Senator Boxer and uh, Chairman Schuster for their bipartisan leadership in moving that uh, legislation forward. If we can uh, see water resources uh, get enacted into law, then certainly all of our attentions can focus on the uh, surface transportation reauthorization and moving that legislation forward. Uh, and I think as we talked earlier, the administration has a proposal. The Senate uh, uh, EPW introduced their bill uh, uh, last, uh, last night. We were certainly encouraged by some of the initial steps forward on freight through MAP 21, but I think collectively we need to see additional really meat on the bone in terms of uh, dedicated programs and dedicated funding for freight in this next uh, reauthorization. I think, I guess, the last message that I would leave in terms, uh, and we certainly heard from uh, the senator in terms of uh, the adversity, and certainly we, we face adversity in terms of the constraints, the fiscal constraints on the federal budget, but I think it's absolutely clear that investments in our transportation infrastructure, and specifically our freight transportation infrastructure, um, uh, is really a, an, an effective and essential utilization of uh, limited federal resources, paying significant dividends in terms of our economy, importantly jobs, our international competitiveness, and probably most uh, significantly in terms related to that federal fiscal realities is that just in, the, in terms of cargo moving through the ports themselves generates over $200 billion a year in uh, tax revenues, and that obviously is a significant aspect, and really is uh, is a golden goose that we need to uh, uh, we need to feed and not and not starve. Thank you, Kirk. Okay, Ed. Thank you, Joni. Uh, I would like to start by 
issuing three thank yous. Uh, first and foremost, uh, to FedEx, UPS, Bulldog Express for your business. Uh, we are in business to serve you. Uh, without you, we would not be in business. So thank you for having uh, the trust uh, to put your, uh, your goods on our, our railroads. Uh, number two, Joni, thank you for uh, the role you play, Diana, and being the glue holding our three industries together. Uh, and Bill, thank you for hosting today. What you may not know is that ATA had planned to have just the first panel, and when we approached them to suggest this panel, uh, Bill was gracious enough to say uh, absolutely so. You pay attention here. Thank you, Bill, for letting us piggyback on your original. <laughs> We, we, we have some old folks in the room, that's good, uh, who, who know what piggyback means. Uh, and uh, I'm particularly pleased uh, because I don't disagree uh, at all with what Phil said about the need for heart surgery on the highway uh, funding uh, side of the house. But there are some bright spots, and this is one of them. Uh, and to put it in perspective, uh, in 1980, 3.1 million containers uh, moved by rail. Uh, that doubled by 1990, 2006. It was 12.3 million. Uh, the recession hit. Uh, obviously, that fell off, uh, but came back to 12.3 in 2012. And last year, uh, set a new record at 12.8 million uh, containers. Uh, and in 2013, Intermodal supplanted King Coal as the number one revenue generator for freight railroads in the United States. Uh, and that is an amazing turnaround. Uh, and and you, you sort of have to ask, now, why did that happen? Well, it happened because we are now able to provide truck-like service. We are now able to provide uh, guaranteed service, uh, service that is dependable. And uh, to put that in perspective, I was reading the other day, I've got to get a life, a transcript of a hearing from 1977 <laughs> in the uh, House Energy Committee, uh, back when 25% of the network was owned by companies in bankruptcy. Uh, slow orders abounded. The Interstate Commerce Commission kept track of my favorite statistic ever called standing derailments. Uh, that was when the train was not moving, but the uh, track was so poorly maintained uh, that the uh, train just pushed it apart and fell to the ground. Uh, and deferred maintenance was the euphemism of the day. No money was going back into the network. Uh, and this hearing was held. Uh, and they were talking about just how awful the service was. In the previous five years, less than 70% of shipments had arrived on time. Well, that's not acceptable, just the, the number. I mean, it's got to be north of 90, and for our uh, uh, premium intermodal, it's uh, close to 100. Uh, so 70, you know, as, as being the benchmark was awful, but then the measurement was plus or minus 24 hours. Well, I know for a fact, and I, I assume it's the same for FedEx, uh, but I'm told anecdotally that for UPS, it's a half hour. Half hour, one way or the other, is on time. Not 24 hours and not 70% of the time, but 100% of the time. So how did that all happen? Craig put his finger on it. Uh, uh, Congress uh, passed the Steigers Rail Act in 1980. Uh, we were partially deregulated, and we were able to reinvest. Over $600 billion dollars reinvested since 1980, $25.5 billion last year, $26 billion this year, and that has allowed us to provide the capacity, the equipment, the signalization, the employees uh, to provide uh, the service needed by our intermodal customers. And so that really uh, is uh, the, the good news story, and we will continue to invest. Uh, right now it's about 40 cents of every dollar. Uh, going back into either maintenance or CapEx, 17% uh, on CapEx alone over the past decade. And it is that kind of investment that allows us to continue to grow and serve ports and, and, and trucking companies. And uh, I would just like to say uh, thank you to, uh, to Bill and Kurt for the uh, partnership that we have uh, here inside the Beltway. Our uh, individual members uh, cooperate every day out in the real world. Uh, sometimes here inside the Beltway we lose sight of uh, the fact that, uh, that uh, we need to cooperate as well. And I was really honored to be uh, a part of an op-ed published today in Transport Topics, and hopefully uh, that will go viral, I think, Bill, mm -hmm. uh, uh, where uh, uh, Bill, Bill and I uh, talked about the success uh, we have had uh, in the real world, in the, in the intermodal world. So thank you again for having us here, and turn it over to you. Okay.
Uh, I'm going to be uh, be brief in the in the interest of time. We had obviously a, an entire hour for for sort of some truck conversation earlier, but let me just uh, uh, I, I I just wonder if my phone's going to ring and I'm going to you know some member's going to call me and say, "What are you doing? Hey, I, I've been fired." See that? What? <laughs> Why do we have the head of AAR in our transport topics? But uh, I, I think uh, I think that's a point worth taking just a second on. Um, you know, we do have a history. E each of us represents a unique set of members in a, un in a, in a unique special mode. Uh, and historically, that meant you were sent to Washington to you know to do battle uh, on behalf of your members and your mode. And uh, and I think the the great and exciting news is is that that's changing. Um, there are still those moments, and, and you know, it's not why we're here today to discuss. But but we have you know positions that we're going to defend, uh, and we're going to advocate on behalf of, of, of what our folks do. But m more often than not, we're starting to see a transformation in in the demands of the shipping community. We're seeing changes in the demands that this economy places on the movement of freight, and it, and it cries out for. Uh, the multimodal solutions that uh, that we're representing and that was represented with UPS and FedEx when they fly a product around this uh, around this world and so uh, to have Joni and Kurt and, and Ed uh, here at ATA and be talking to all of you uh, on a day when we're emphasizing the need to invest in infrastructure we need uh, we need to raise all the boats uh, in this uh, at this particular time because our economy simply cries out and, and demands that. Not long ago, we, we didn't discuss it in our, in our uh, panel, but, but both Phil Bird and Pat Thomas uh, were down in Panama at the Panama mm -hmm. Canal, Kurt. The whole idea was we needed to have a better idea of what's going on with the movement of international cargo and how it might or might not impact uh, uh, ports both on the west and the east coast and the kind of investment that, that your folks are all uh, you know making in order to be more efficient and and uh, and deal with uh, you know the growth in container movements those containers are either going to come into the country and get moved by truck or or onto rail your folks ed or they're going to be con you know containers that are getting loaded up and and leaving the country in one form or fashion and that's just uh, the nature of how the economy is is starting to move the last thing I want to say is uh, I appreciate it immensely, uh, Senator Blumenthal, Senator Blunt, and, and especially Senator Carper coming by, and and, uh, and I thought that uh, uh, for Tom to sort of get out on the limb there on the funding uh, piece was, uh, I, I appreciate it immensely because at some point someone's got to lead. Uh, someone's got to have the, you know, the, 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 the willingness to really sort of step out there and begin to encourage other colleagues in some form or fashion is to find that uh, that funding solution that we so desperately need. And, and obviously, we have a particular bias on the one we hope they gravitate towards. But whatever it is, uh, it's going to take a lot of uh, significant lifting over there to get us to get us the kind of money we need to invest in infrastructure again for for all the modes of transportation. So we're thrilled to have you all here today and be partnering with all of you. Thank, Thank you. Tony. Okay. Um, we, we discussed in, in detail some of the issues that we're going to uh, re-examine here on this panel. So uh, we're going to approach it from a more multimodal versus strictly trucking. So um, assuming that us as freight stakeholders need to build a platform that we can all support and take to the Hill, you've seen two bills that have been released. Um, can you associate those bills with your top two or three infrastructure priorities from your constituents' perspective? Are you seeing what you thought? Are, are th there some things missing? I defer to AAPA. AAPA has taken the lead over the last two decades, really, in pulling together the freight stakeholders. So. And it's, it's a continuing work in progress. And I, you know, uh, certainly uh, we value the participation of all, all. We have about 17 or 18 folks in that, in that coalition. But uh, obviously, we're still uh, pouring over the, the EPW bill that was uh, introduced last uh, uh, last night and uh, 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 still looking at the specifics. We're certainly encouraged, I think, in general that it, uh, it has as a prominent feature uh, a, a freight chapter, as the, as the senator, senator uh, called it. Uh, we're, we're looking at in terms of how the, the funding mechanism would work. It looks like it's a, a formula funding type, type scenario. Um, I, I think the important uh, aspect is to, again, to ensure that it looks at it multimodally, 
uh, as opposed to uh, any sort of uh, in individual modes or not looking at the connection, interconnections between, between modes. Um, I think that's the important next step coming out of MAP21 and the, the beginnings, anyway, of the development of a national freight policy. I think it's kind of telling in, a, in an unfortunate way that we as a country don't have a national freight policy until now, and it's still being, being developed and looking at a national freight strategic plan. I think it's important that, that this next iteration of reauthorization, again, puts specificity to that, dedicated uh, funding uh, for, uh, for that. Uh, so I'm, I'm encouraged that the EPW bill has a significant focus and attention to freight. Again, we need to look at the specifics. Certainly, again, the, 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 the administration's bill where it had various in incentive mechanisms toward uh, putting a, uh, having states uh, put additional funding and recognition on, on, on moving freights, all of those are positive. Again, as somebody mentioned earlier, the, the devil is certainly the details in terms of how you're going to fund that. How do you prioritize that? But I think there is an increasing awareness and recognition both within the administration and on Capitol Hill toward uh, a higher priority and focus on, on freight. Ed, uh, from a rail perspective, uh, well, what are your top priorities? From a rail perspective, we are not really looking for new programs for rail. Uh, I like the uh, focus on freight that uh, really emerged in MAP 21 and I think is going to continue in this bill uh, and the reauthorization. Uh, we're taking a look, I think our number one priority would be uh, trying to get some regulatory streamlining for rail projects uh, similar to that which was in MAP 21 and I, I assume survived into the Word of Conference uh, report uh, on, the, on the water side. Uh, a, a classic case is just a few blocks from here, the Virginia Avenue Tunnel uh, that CSX is trying to widen. Uh, it is right now a single track. It's about 100 years old, uh, and they need to uh, heighten it so they can double stack. It is the last pinch point on their north-south route paralleling 95. Uh, it has been in process now for five years. They have to do an environmental impact statement. There's not one penny of federal dollars involved. It is all private money. Actually, there's some state of Virginia money because Virginia recognizes that that's an important uh, route for their ports uh, to get inland. Uh, and the federal connection is that during construction, the ramp onto 95 might be uh, shut down or adversely affected. So we now have a environmental impact statement that's been going on for five years. Uh, the cost is going up. Uh, some of you might actually live there and you might be participating in the uh, interminable uh, neighborhood meetings, uh, and you know we talk about wanting to build 1,800 jobs, private money, ready to go. Uh, if you have to go through a, a process, let's at least uh, do it uh, logically and quickly and get it done so that these projects that do get approved can move forward. So that, that would be our number okay, one. Okay, great. Well, Joni, I, I think if, if uh, you know, we you know, weren't particularly enamored with the administration's proposal. Obviously, we've, we've beat the tolling thing up, you know, quite a bit, but we just, we just are not, uh, we don't think that's the right solution, and, and we're, we're skeptical about actually generating the kind of money they're suggesting out of, out of the tax reform piece. Um, and, uh, and obviously, um, uh, you know, we, we liked at least our first, first glance at the, at the proposal from last night. Um, it's just sort of like taking MAP 21 and extending it into a six-year program. Uh, I think it's five years, uh, kind of the freight program, leaves some flexibility for some of the money to get spent on some things that might not be exactly roads and bridges, but in keeping with why we're here today, um, we need to figure out how to, how to improve the connectivity between all the different modes. And, and while there might be a few people in my industry that might fuss about sharing one dime, uh, elsewhere, it, it's probably something that you know makes sense for us to be supportive of and encourage. So, um, you know, we we're you know optimistic programmatically with what we came out last night. I think again that the devil's in the details for where we're going to get the money. That was going to be one of my follow-up questions, but <clears throat> we'll we'll shift gears. Um, going back to the field trip that you took in Panama, one of the the questions that I thought people would be interested in hearing you respond to is 
whether the transportation infrastructure in our NAFTA partners, Canada and Mexico, um, measure up to the U.S. Uh, are there lessons that we've learned from those trading partners in terms of design, construction, maintenance of their system that we could uh, hopefully migrate that would improve our system? Because we are, the North American economy obviously is... Uh, is in, 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 the rate, in the rail uh, side of the house, uh, Canadian railroads, Mexican railroads are members of the AR, uh, and uh, they operate pretty seamlessly. Uh, so I think it is, uh, we operate to the same standards, uh, many of the same regulations. Uh, so I don't know that there's a whole lot of cross-pollinization. One of the areas that we are concerned about is uh, trying to uh, facilitate faster movements across the borders uh, th through customs, uh, particularly uh, be between the U.S. and Mexico. Okay. Well, the, 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 yeah, the Canadians seem to be a lot more uh, uh, willing to, uh, to uh, I guess I'll call it, be innovative with, with the movement of freight on their side of the, of the border. We, uh, we have some limitations. Uh, anybody from Canada that comes down to the United States runs into some hurdles immediately with their cabotage issue and not being able to, to relocate empty trailers and things like that. And it's not the most efficient use of their, their tractors, uh, the fuel they burn, and their drivers. and, and uh, so we could probably learn something from them. Now, they, they do use slightly larger trucks, Ed, up in Canada uh, to their productivity benefit, but, but that's not <laughs> we're here, what we're here to talk about today. Kurt, uh, we know yeah. we have issues in terms of comparing the ports, both in Canada and Mexico, to U.S. ports. Yeah, and, and uh, similar to Ed, our association includes uh, both Canadian and, and Mexican ports as well. I think the, the primary... I guess uh, uh, di distinction and lessons learned, uh, I think, is that the, uh, the Canadian um, uh, uh, government uh, recognized uh, probably six, seven or more years ago of the, the v value and the benefit of, of efficiently moving, moving goods and moving freight and uh, being competitive, uh, certainly not only globally, but certainly here in, in North America. And they, uh, they develop their uh, Canadian Gateway strategy where they have uh, specific policy and prioritization for uh, both uh, from a policy standpoint, a funding standpoint, but also a, a facilitation standpoint of improving the, the goods movement system uh, connecting uh, Canadian ports uh, not only into the, the hinterland of Canada, but certainly into the heartland of, of America. And that's been a very... I think a very successful strategy uh, for uh, for Canada, and and we certainly again uh, suggest that as a lessons learned for our U.S. transportation, particularly our U.S. freight policy, that we do need to establish a policy that it is in the the nation's best interest to efficiently move goods and freight, and to develop uh, programs and a prioritization for doing that competitively to serve our heartland. Um, I have one more question I'll throw out, and then I'm, I'm sure we have um, some questions from the audience, and I'd be re remiss if I didn't focus a little bit on intermodal specifically. So if we have a dime that you offered us for uh, multimodal projects, um, what are specific types of infrastructure investments that could support the growth of multimodal, intermodal transportation, which is now a legitimate alternative versus the stepchild that it had been for, for years and years? What would you do with that dime multiplied however many times, Ed? Well, the uh, Tiger program, and before that, the uh, projects of regional and national significance, maybe they've changed that because of the acronym, I'm not sure, uh, it, which were in some of the previous authorizations, uh, provide the resources to state and local governments for public-private partnerships. And I mentioned uh, the Virginia Avenue Tunnel uh, some of that uh, is Virginia money. Some of the other, uh, Heartland Corridor, for example, I know had some uh, federal dollars going to some of the states uh, to be paired with the private uh, sector investment. And one of the things we like about the private-public uh, partnership idea is uh, the private sector puts up the money for, pub uh, for the private benefits, the public sector uh, for the public benefits. And so those kinds of... Uh, partnerships make sense, and so I'd like to see if there is money uh, available. Uh, that would be a good, it seems to me, good good way to, uh, to go forward. Okay. 
Governor, um, you have examples of P, P, P cubed? Well, <laughs> I, I think that, uh, you know, f first mile, last mile, I mean, w you know, any anything that's going to create uh, an expedient exchange of the container coming off the ship at the port, moving on to truck, you know, getting moved by truck to a railhead and, and loaded onto rail. I mean, we, again, the, the uh, uh, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that the, the explosive growth of intermodal, and we expect to see that continue, um, is, is going to be a, an area of, in, of infrastructure investment that we're going to need to focus more dollars on. So uh, I don't think we, we can be, again, uh, too fussy about anything that's helping us connect with uh, either of these guys. And I would uh, wholeheartedly agree with that. I think the, the, that interconnectivity between the, the modes and the intermodal facilities is, is critical. It's certainly an area that uh, has historically seen uh, very little attention and, and, uh, and, and focus. Uh, certainly uh, that, that first last mile into and out of our ports uh, creates a lot of issues for whether it's uh, 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 truckers, whether it's rail connections, and certainly the local community. So, that area, I think that interconnectivity would certainly be one of our priorities for okay. that, um, that dime uh, aspect. Okay. Looks like Eric is ready to jump in. Go ahead. We're going to fire away. Um, jump in. I've got some questions. Um, Kurt, you mentioned the National Freight Plan that's kind of being developed right now by the Department of Transportation. Is it the fact that, and aside from the election, just other problems with trying to get a uh, fully funded transportation bill this year, isn't, wouldn't, if we even did a bill now, wouldn't that be getting the cart before the horse when the transportation freight plan uh, isn't even ready yet? The DOT is probably not going to have that ready until, I don't know, maybe next year. So, you know, wouldn't that be ideal or wouldn't that be necessary to have that in place before you do all the, you know, planning and how you're going to spend the money? And then second of all, uh, can you give us any details or any thoughts on what your understanding is of uh, some of the key aspects of the uh, Water Resource and Development Bill that passed? Uh, I know it's probably not out yet, but uh, what have you been told about some of the highlights? So everybody heard the questions. The first one is, uh, is it a little bit premature to, to focus on surface reauthorization when we don't have a national freight plan that's been released by DOT. I think that's had the longest gestation period of anything out of DOT. And then secondly, some specifics under the water resources development that you find um, are encouraging. Um, I guess to steal a line from President Obama, we can't wait, I guess would be the, the, the summary of, of that is that uh, we, uh, uh, we are already uh, far behind. Uh, Governor Gray, Graves mentioned uh, a number of uh, his folks traveling down to, to Panama to, to get a, a first-hand look at that. Um, certainly, Panama is a nation. In other words, it's not, it, you know, it, it, it's not so much that we are responding to the investments that Panama is making, but the reality is that Panama is you know, responding to the realities in the, you know, the global trade and the global marketplace. And they recognize to be competitive moving forward as a nation and certainly as a canal that they needed to make significant in investments to improve. Um, we do as well. I think a lot of what we're looking for in terms of this next uh, authorization is really putting the, really the, the, the policy and the programs in place, not necessarily saying you shall fund Project A or Project B. So I think the, you know, that process can go on really concurrently with the development of the, the policy slash plan uh, at, at DOT. Uh, in terms of water resources bill, we are anxiously awaiting the, the, the specifics. Um, it, uh, it sounds like from some of the things that, that we've heard some, uh, some members of Congress uh, mention is that they are looking to move toward uh, full utilization of our maintenance tax uh, over the next 10 years. One of the things that uh, Senator Vitter mentioned, which we've been certainly uh, advocating for for many years, is changing the cost share uh, level from a depth of 45 feet to 50 feet to accommodate the larger vessels that are that are in uh, international trade, and, and also to, to Ed's point about streamlining uh, of streamlining the process of getting to a y yes or no. I mean, right. it's 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 a matter of knowing, not necessarily. It's not like we're saying you need to circumvent the process, but you need to get to a, a yes or no 
uh, much quicker than we are now. And also, as we understand, uh, there'll be more flexibility for whether it's our local members, uh, uh, individual states, or whatever the case may be, to be able to advance funding, uh, have a little bit more flexibility to move to advance uh, uh, projects, advance funding, to, uh, to, to get projects moving uh, when uh, we're in a uh, uncertainty in terms of whether there'll be federal, uh, uh, federal funding uh, being appropriated. I guess it will remain to be seen in terms of the specifics. We did advocate for inclusion that you could actually have more flexibility to actually help do the study part of it as well as the construction. So hopefully that would be part of the part of the bill as well. Any other feedback on the, the policy development from DOT? Well, I was only going to comment, Eric, that uh, um, I mean the you're making an assumption that, 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 you know, the powers that be in Congress are going to care about an administration developed uh, freight, you know, freight program policy. Uh, the, administration, the administration didn't choose to wait for it to get done before they, they rolled out their bill. Of course, that's because they were so behind the, you know, behind the eight ball, if you will. But uh, I, uh, I, you know, I, I'm probably not one that ha has great expectations for uh, outcomes tied to whatever the administration's, you know, plan, uh, you know, tells us. Yes, maybe. About 10 years ago, this is directed at Bill and Ted, uh, around 10 years ago, the two of you signed basically a truce heading into, I think, what was safe, became safety league. And you basically said, we're not going to fight each other. But now the, the challenge has become so much more critical and the fiscal constraints are so much more critical that Instead of just not fighting each other, you, you really both need productivity gains and you both need some uh, relief, uh, I, I would say. Would you be willing to go further and each of you pick at least one thing that the other could then support? <laughs> Instead of just saying we won't fight each other, you will actually support us. And, and if, if so, what would that one thing be for each of you? Okay, question is, um, hearkening back to the, the truce that was signed, uh, a while ago, but um, bottom line is, are there areas of compromise that um, ATA and AAR can suggest under a reauthorization bill? I absolutely uh, support Bill's desire to pay more gas tax. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that's the area you were referring to, but... Uh, that was not the I, answer I wanted to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> Avery, I, I think the, the honest answer is, is, is I, I don't think at this moment there is still a path forward on the productivity piece. Um, I mean, there is, there is certainly a lot of conversation uh, about it. Uh, you know, there's still on my side of the aisle, I mean, there's all kinds of ideas and proposals that, that different elements of our industry have. I mean, Bill Logue spoke to the, the, the Twin 33 piece, uh, but um, it is, uh, it's very, very important to us. But it is it is probably not the most important uh, uh, issue that's on our on our plate. You, you you deserve more than a smart ass response. Sorry, uh, and 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 that is to say, I have asked, and the industry has asked, all members of Congress to uh, keep their powder dry, as the saying goes, on the truck size and weight issue until the uh, study that was in uh, Map 21 is completed. Uh, I think they're working diligently on that and uh, so you know hopefully that'll be out sometime later this year and I think that that uh, will help inform uh, the the, uh, the discussion and the debate at that time okay other questions mark Okay, question is, uh, speak to the connectivity and the, the first and last mile as that seems to expand and how that impacts the cost of the movement. Well, the, 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 
the delays caused by congestion are, are not only, you know, there are delays that are occurring whether we're going to make an intermodal move or, or not. Um, and uh, I can't put a price tag on what, you know, what that's costing the industry or the shipping community, but, um, and it's not just congestion. There are other operational challenges we're facing right now that are, that are causing us some real problems with providing service levels and the kinds of specific pickup and delivery times that, that, that customers are, have come to expect. When you actually add the other mode into it, uh, it even gets more complicated because then you've got two modes that have to run on schedule, on time, in order to meet that that customer's demands. And and uh, you know that's the challenge Ed's guys face. And but it's it's not a challenge we don't face every day. You know, in, in our own right, just moving truck freight around this country. Not exactly on point, but to to the point of the the connectivity. Uh, and going back to my discussion about regulatory reform, uh, another poster child is the near dock intermodal facility that BNSF is trying to build out in uh, LA Long Beach. Rachel, you're on your ninth year now, uh, uh, and, and I think celebrated uh, at year eight getting the draft EIS out. Uh, and so they are continuing, and, and that would address part of what you're talking about. It would be on dock. And uh, Phil, I think it's the city of Charleston and North Charleston have been, you know, going back and forth at each other, trying to figure out how to work that project out so that it would be on dock and, and again, sort of make that transition and handoff, at least on the port side, uh, easier. And I'm sure you've got a million other examples. Yeah, yeah I, I, certainly the, 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 the regulatory reform aspect is so critical to, to that in terms of being able to, again, move these, move these projects uh, at least to conclusion. But, um, uh, you know, I think that is, from a policy standpoint, the streamlining that we've seen in, in, MAP, uh, in MAP 21 and, and Water Resources Bill, hopefully, and then in the next uh, iteration uh, is, 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 I think, still extremely important if we are going to kind of, to Eric's question, kind of essentially catch up a little bit toward where, where our uh, where we need to be as a, as a system to be able to move those goods efficiently. And like you said, the shipper ultimately cares about the bottom line. <clears throat> and, and while that's certainly important on imported cargo, it's absolutely vital on export cargo if we're going to be competitive. We can't get, get it uh, uh, from, from uh, production to uh, not only to our ports, but out of our ports uh, competitively. If we can't do that uh, seamlessly and competitively, we're not going to we're not going to compete as a country. So I'm hearing, you know, we have funding issues, but almost as important, if not, is the processes that need to be employed under this next bill to um, basically deploy the specific programs. So I think that's that's something that um, we all need to keep our keep our eyes on are the, the specific processes that are employed to make use of whatever infrastructure funding is is given to us. Anyone else? Eric? Go ahead. Uh, Bill, when you kicked off the, the very beginning of the event, you made some cryptic allusion to uh, Capitol Hill being kind of tone, kind of indifferent right now, or maybe, uh, you know, a repetitive record, uh, not being kind of really receptive to hearing the need for infrastructure investment now. I wasn't quite sure what you were getting at, but, um, you know, maybe you can explain what you meant there, um, but to what extent are you, uh, your members, or you as carriers and at the AAR bringing in customers, uh, you know, the shippers, the users of your uh, fleets, um, to to make the case for infrastructure so it's not just the carriers? And I know other organizations uh, that have uh, retail manufacturers are doing that, but you know, you're trying to accentuate question is, um, what, what's been the outreach of AAR and ATA and I'm sure AAPA as the associations are developing um, the infrastructure needs and requirements? So how are you dealing with your uh, shipper beneficial cargo? I, I, Eric, my, my initial comments maybe, you know, ha had more to do with just the frustration that I think everyone in the transportation community has over uh, Congress's, you know, inability I mean, to appreciate that it's not like they don't have advance warning that this is, you know, coming back around. Um, and in fact, if anything, it's, it's here more quickly than it normally would be because we could only do a two-year bill 
uh, you know, in, in Map 21. Uh, I think several people articulated the importance of, of the longer term bills for planning purposes at all levels of, 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 of state and local government, and I can certainly relate to that from, from my previous position. So, you know, there's, there's probably a bit of frustration uh, uh, that, that uh, again, that, that there's not sort of more bold uh, leadership on the issue, uh, you know, on Capitol Hill. But I understand that it, Capitol Hill works in mysterious ways and, and uh, at their own pace. Um, and I do think that at the moment now, the pace has picked up. Uh, and as I said in my earlier comments, I think the fact that the administration came out with a bill is, is helpful, may not have a lot of things in it that we're particularly enamored with, but I think it's a positive step forward. I thought the EP, EPW announcement last night, don't, not sure why it was at 9 o'clock at night, but it was uh, nonetheless, it was, it was welcome. And I know that, that Chairman Schuster is very, you know, intent on, on doing his work on the House side. So I, I think, uh, think this will get done. It just it seems to, to me to always be harder than it otherwise uh, you know, needs to be. Yes, we are trying to mobilize as many, uh, not just uh, uh, of our members, but working with coalitions especially in the shipper community and trying to get them more engaged in explaining to folks on Capitol Hill what the impacts are on the economic competitiveness of their companies vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, others around the world in having uh, delays and, and you might say uh, unintended consequences in, in shipping expense, um, you know, because of our, our lack of a strong, uh, you know, robust uh, federal funded program. Um, that's part of what I think we've been asked to do and, and uh, Tom Carper, uh, you know, spoke very clearly of that. I think Roy Blunt did as well. And, and we're doing all we can to mobilize uh, people to, to tell their stories. And I, I would just uh, add on there very quickly. I think Janet Cavanoke was here, and uh, she may have had to slip out. But uh, the chamber, uh, representing a lot of uh, users of the, of the system, has been very out front and very, very outspoken. And I would just add that that Freight Stakeholders Coalition I talked about includes Janet in the chamber and a number right. of the shipper groups, and, and certainly as uh, ports, I can say that uh, you know our our discussions in terms of advocating uh, the the related infrastructure issues that we've been talking about really recognize the the value and the importance of really bringing the BCOs in uh, in and uh, and again letting them talk about uh, the the real world that yeah. uh, they were t mm. uh, talking about in terms of what what it means to them on a day to day basis. I think the, the um, shipping community has gotten much more vocal and organized if you follow what the National Retail Federation has been doing uh, as it relates to potential uh, labor problems on the West Coast. So uh, I think if we all um, can continue to work with them and educate them and incent them, uh, that's a good starting point, I think. So any other questions from the audience? Otherwise, I, I'm going to ask our um, esteemed panelists to put um, their crystal ball gazing eyes on and just uh, this is a typical wrap up I think when you talk about reauthorization so are we going to get a bill when are we going to get a bill and how long of a bill is it going to be well yes we're going to get a bill that's <laughs> <laughs> um, a throwaway I, 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 I happen to be one that thinks it's uh, sometime in the uh, in the uh, spring of next year um, and I think it'll be a, a, you know, it'll be a full, you know, six-year authorization. Uh, what I still don't know is how they're going to pay for it. And I totally agree. I, I just don't see how they get it uh, a six-year bill done between now and the okay. election. But I think first, second quarter Kurt? next year. Yeah, I would. I would not disagree so with go. that either. So how are we going to bridge? What's going to be the bridge till next spring? I think we had a and graphic it. illustration by Senator Carper, at there least in go. the short term. That'd be my guess. Yep. Well, as I, I've been, belie I believe that the bridge, the the, the, the money they have to find to, to shore up the Highway Trust Fund, will actually be a a, a you know a teachable moment um, because it's a small small sliver of what's going to have to be found in order to do the full bill, and and I think that will awaken a few people to some of the realities of of. Uh, when you have a lot of users clamoring to help continue paying in the traditional fashion, uh, it might start to look more appealing to them. Okay. Could, could I just make it clear? I don't think any one of us is suggesting that's the right outcome or nope. advocating that, but 
trying no, to be. No, I think it's, it's the ballish. reality yeah, that right. we're dealing with then, and it harkens back to the question about what are you doing in the meantime to, to prepare. So I appreciate everyone's comments this afternoon. Thanks, appreciate thank everyone's you, attendance, and uh, thank you very much. Thank